violin of sorrow I hear you crying The tune is mournful The moon is dying The clay's music Is heard no more Was turned to ash by Flames of war In death's dark chamber No music echoes The clay's light is Dimmed forever The strings were broken One fearful day The children's hair has Turned to gray So play me now another tune My mournful violin Bring back those memories to me And let them burn within So come and play me one by one Your age of sweet refrain And let my heart renew itself And bring me hope again During the time that you spent at Pechora Camp, were there any cases that a family or one person, after he or she remained alone, escaped from the camp and never came back? There were such cases, but I don't want to leave my parents. I was able to escape, to escape by myself, but I could not leave my mother and my sister. When they herded people from Moglia, I overheard that there were ghettos somewhere where you could escape to. But how could I possibly leave my mother? In fact, my escape from the camp and that I was bringing back either a piece of bread or a potato made it actually possible for them to survive. The truth is some people managed to escape from that camp. Those who had gold or money entered into an agreement with the policemen. They walked outside. Many of them were caught on the road and shot. Many people managed to escape to Mogilev, where the ghetto was. It was completely different from the camp. Now they confuse camp and ghetto, but they differed a lot. In the ghetto, they lived in their own houses. In the ghetto, they had food to eat and clothes to wear. But here we are hungry and cold and had lice. We could not wash ourselves or change clothes or eat. We could do nothing. Everybody looked so awful that we didn't even pay attention to each other. And every day, fewer and fewer people remained alive. When somebody managed to run outside the camp, did they go to get food only? Yes. Or were they also begging for money, which could be used to buy something? No, no one was giving any money. I don't know such cases. We only were begging for food. We didn't want anything else. We just needed something to eat. We needed food. Nobody gave us either money or clothes. We needed to eat something, not to die of hunger. It is hunger and cold. I am walking along Pechora indifferently. I know that in that house, in that red house, I will show it to you, the Germans are living. But I am walking straight to them, to the Germans. I come up to the doors, and a German man says to me, Come in. I come in. From the way I look, he is already aware where I came from. They were not military Germans. They were the builders, the older men. He asked me whether I want to eat. 
I say yes. I haven't eaten anything for seven to eight days already. It was so cold that you just could not go anywhere. He brings me a mess tin with hot cereal and meat in it. I eat it. He asks me whether I would want to eat some more. I say yes, I would. He brings me the second mess tin. I eat it. He asks where, whether I would eat the third one. I say yes, I would eat the third one too. He called his co-workers to take a look at me and they started surrounding me and staring at me. They are staring at me and I am eating. To put it shortly, I ate four mess tins. I had an empty sack behind my back. It was just an ordinary sack made from homespun material. I had a couple of potatoes there. He brings a loaf of bread, brick-like, and says that the bread is stale and asks whether I will take it. I say I will, naturally. So every German brings me a loaf of bread and puts it into that sack. There were 20 loaves total. We were not able to tie up the sack, and they pierced it with a nail. So I start walking along the Bug River, taking the lower path, and I carry that bread. I came out in the morning and came back in the evening, but I did not throw any of it away. Now, when I see how they throw away food and bread and everything, I have that picture before my eyes. And who knows, maybe that bread helped us to survive. It was already January of 1944. The end of 1943, uh, my mother took myself and joined to a group of people and es escaped from the camp. How did that escape occur? How, did, how was she able, and how were the people able to get out? They, the, that time, when they started already gradually liquidation of the camp, so there were less guards around. They didn't guard like before, like in 1941, 42. And people found some places probably how to get over the fence and escape. So it was a group of people. And somebody know, knew probably how to get back home. And we joined this group. My mother knew. And you so went back to? Uh, Mogilev, to Mogilev. Mogilev, yeah. At night time we used to go in daytime, hiding in the forests. Yeah. One time we were, uh, my mother told me, I was sick that time. Uh, my mother told that we were so exhausted that we didn't get another choice like go to a village and ask for help. And uh, we got, we've been fortunate. One lady get us. We stayed overnight there, she gave us food, and then she said, go, because if somebody will know that you are here, they will kill our family and you. So then we left, and so again joined the group, and we came to Mogilev, but it was still occupied, it was still ghetto, we came back to ghetto. On one beautiful day at dawn, the policemen and Romanians came. There were mostly Germans and Lithuanians with dogs. They were walking from room to room and forcing people to come out and fall in line at the plaza. So they made us fall in line and started sorting us. Young and healthy were brought close to the entrance and old people and children to another side. We heard that the older people would be shot and the holes in the ground were ready for them, while the young people would be taken by the Germans to work so they would remain alive. So SS men really came. By the way, among those SS men were both Latvians and Estonians. The Germans came and started selecting people for work. They started forcing people to walk out from the buildings, barracks, and auxiliary premises. Also, who was not able to walk out was shot immediately. They did not ask us anything. There were puddles of blood and masses of corpses. That's what I can tell you. We saw how many dead bodies remained after they had taken away those people. There were hundreds of dead bodies of those who were not able to walk out. So how they were taking people to work, it was 1942, the column stands. They were walking, holding their babies in their arms. 
they pull out that baby from her arms and hit him against the tree or against the ground. Did you see that with your own eyes? That's what I saw. They told us to throw all our belongings, which we had with us, into a dry fountain. I only had a bag with me, that was my savior, but I did not throw it away. Frankly speaking, I said I would die with the bag because a half a year or so, that bag had been a reason that I'm still alive. That bag saved my life, so I did not throw it away. When they trans started transferring or loading people into the cars, whether they drove one or two cars with people outside, I don't remember because I was standing at the end. We will go there and you will see. I was standing near the fountain while people were standing all the way up to the gates. There were machine guns ready standing by. Suddenly we heard that everything stopped and became quiet. Why it became quiet, nobody knew. It was a Romanian commandant in the camp. His German boss used to come here. That Romanian was the German subordinate. Sastruat was his name. They were saying it was Sastruat. His assistant name was Lev. Was it his first name or his last name or a nickname? I was just calling him so. That commandant, Stratua, was more or less human. Lev, his deputy, was just a beast. He was walking with a big dog. And if he did not like something, he, you, he would sick the dog on you. He didn't even want to touch you. His dog was dealing with you. Some time passed, we heard that the commandant is walking with Polya Zeitzler, his interpreter. She was a Romanian Jew or a Bessarabian Jew, I cannot tell. There were some pedestal steps where the pioneers used to stand. The statue of Lenin was standing. <clears throat> she stood up on that pedestal and talked to us. Jews, you are set free. You will not be shot anymore. So do you think that everybody wanted to walk away? No way. Nobody wanted to walk away. Everybody wanted to be shot. They did not have any more energy to suffer. Summer. Everything was green and the weather was warm. A car with the Germans came in. Before that, the Germans would take people to work. It happened before we came here while we were in Rogoznoi. The Germans had a slogan, use and eliminate. So the Germans' car drove in. It was a huge one. There are refrigerators like that nowadays. It was covered with tent. The Germans were sitting there. They jumped out of it and herded everyone outside. They started doing so-called a natural selection. But you understand, there are decent people among the Romanians. They have been, they are, and they will be. The camp commandant went to call to Tiraspol, the capital city. The capital of Transnistria was Tiraspol, not Kizhenev or Chernotsky. They all had governing authorities there. He went to call there and he got a response that the camp was organized not for killing people. He came and told the Germans so they would not permit them to take people away by the cars. And that was all. So the Germans left with nothing. And that was all. And the people were not killed. There was a half empty room there. People were taken away. Two days passed. Two days later, again, the repetition of the same thing. Again, SS men. Again, the policemen with sleeves rolled up, showing a seamy side and lots of dogs. Again, we were forced to come out. 
Those who were not able to walk were shot. Some were shot, some were killed with the butts of guns. They kept on killing people. Some people jumped down from the balconies to kill themselves. We were herded there and directed towards the gate. They brought the cars. Those who were the smartest managed to get in the first cars. We were trailing behind. Again, Sobol, the father of Lisa Sofro, came up to us. He told us, listen, kids, if you have some food with you, you need to eat it. You cannot die hungry. We are being taken to be shot, so we need to eat. We had a little food with us, so we ate it. We were waiting to be brought to the place where we would be shot, so everything would be done and all our suffering would be over. Then we noticed that there were fewer and fewer Germans, fewer guards, and the car had not been driven outside. They were not going but standing still, and we were standing and waiting. While standing all the way behind with the others, I suddenly saw a girl walking by. Her name was Zeltzer, Polina Zeltzer. She was in a blue skirt and white blouse. She was an interpreter at the Gendarmere. She was a Romanian Jew and spoke Romanian well. We were walking behind her. We saw the commandant, a Romanian guy. She announced, people, you were saved. You will not be killed. Go back to your rooms. It is impossible to describe that scene. We did not have anything to maintain our lives with nothing to wear. Why would we have to go on living like that? Why did they make us keep on living? If they had shot us, we would have laid together in one hole and that would have been it. Otherwise, what did we need to stay alive for? Well, we had to go back to our rooms. I don't know who he was, Commandant Polkovnik Stratulat, I don't know what kind of person he was, the Commandant, Colonel Stratolat. I saw him many times. Once I saw him at a special circumstances in September 1942, when we all were herded together to the square with all belongings we had with us. Everybody was outside, from every place, from horse barns, basements, etc. The Germans surrounded us again. I was sitting in the first car in which two front wheels were already outside the camp territory. There was obviously God there, or fate, you know. Suddenly he came, looking tall and dressy, in a beautiful hat, and we heard, Dute a casa, go home. Now, we know that he had told the Germans that the camp was their territory and could not be governed by them, so they would deal with that themselves and he made them leave. I remember Polya, an interpreter, a very beautiful girl, very beautiful. They say that she saved us, because she, I don't want to say how, what relationship she had with Stratolot, she just ran up to him. There was a song written in Yiddish, I barely remember it, but I sang it. I used to sing it at that time, it said that Stratolot saved us. Here is the place. This is not a working pool. It did not work at that time, too. And there is a square in front of the building. We were herded together in September. They told us to throw our belongings down there, into this pool. In the month of September, on one beautiful day, the cars drove through the gates. The military people were sitting in the bodies of the cars. They were wearing Soviet uniforms and flight caps. We thought they were our troops who came to liberate us. Later on, I understood that they were Vyasovites. They had tridents on their flight caps. It looked just like our current Ukrainian emblem. So they went to the barracks and started forcing all people to come outside. They told them to take all their belongings and with them and come out. They organized a chain and sorted out people. 
They moved young people on one side and small children and old people on another side. They put the young people in the cars. They put in the cars my two sisters and my uncle. I was also in that car. I was on the side where the young people were. They drove us out through the gate towards Vinitsa. They were building Hitler's headquarters there. We came to know that later. At that time, nobody knew that. Every car had two via Soviets in it. I can't remember now what place we were at. Now I realize that it was Sokol Etz. We did not reach Nemirov. We stopped. Why they stopped, I don't know. I had, I had diarrhea and naturally spoiled the air badly. And the via Soviets started beating me and pushed me off the car, telling me to go and air that stank. I jumped down. At that moment, they were ordered to go and they left. I was standing there. Yes, that was how I remained alive. I came back to the camp. I took a path low by the river. When I was back, I saw a horrible picture. Many people were killed, shot, and beaten up. In the bakery attic, the family of Estrelius, of six people, was shot. He was working as a baker and was acquainted with those policemen. The policemen took all his welfare and told him that they would hide him. They told him that people were being taken to be shot. He gave to them all the valuables he had. They hid him, but also sent the Via Soviets to get him. They came and shot the whole family right there in the attic. The whole family was lying in a puddle of blood. Again, the camp life resumed. I would like to ask you, do you know what happened to those who remained in the car and where they were driven to? They were driven to the Hitler's headquarters. They were working there. They worked there and they shot them afterwards. How did you come to know that? After returning from Pechora, my friend Ilya Vladimirovich Kalik stayed with me. His sister was also taken there. He was living with his mother. We lived in the same apartment when we were back in the ghetto, so his mama went there. She found out that they shot everybody. Those people worked very hard building the headquarters and then they all were killed. No one remained alive there. Further on, we had the famous road which we were herded by to be shot. From here, by this road, Polina Zeister came with commandment Stratuat. She came up to the spot where the statues were standing, or maybe further, and said, Good people, you will not be shot. You were, were left off, and you will not be shot anymore. Nothing will happen. Many times I witnessed the Germans coming to the camp territory and raping the girls. My female classmate, I don't want to mention her name, my female classmate was raped before our very eyes. The guy just threw her to the side and that's it. So what for him? Was he afraid of somebody or was he shy? Not at all. He was a master. And who were you? You were nothing. You were not a human being. I cannot grasp all of that if I start recollecting all that. How could it possibly happen? How could we live through all that? I don't know. It was a senior policeman by the name Smetansky. That monster was holding a whip with a piece of metal at the end, in one hand and a stick in another. He used to hit people with the stick in the head and, and with the whip in their legs. He would knock you off your feet and hit you in the head and kill you. Nobody who was hit by him survived. When he hit you, you are done. You will not survive. Did he do it professionally? 
quite profession professionally. If, if Smetansky appeared in the camp, people would run away everywhere they were able to. He was chasing people. Some Russian girls took me into their brigade, and I came up with them to the sanatorium to beg. I was lucky to obtain something. Smetansky singled me out of everybody, and he crooked his finger at me, beckoning me co closer. Who was Smetansky? A policeman. He was the cruelest one. All the policemen were cruel. He hit me 25 times on the back. Smetansky Lukian Lukian Smetansky was 25 or 26 years old, a young, big, and handsome man. He was not a decent guy. What I mean is that he did not serve the Germans or Romanians faithfully. He took bribes and everybody knew that. Everybody knew that if Smetansky was in a good mood and he needed money or some other things, you could buy your freedom from him and he would arrange your escape from the camp. However, at the same time, he was very cruel, and that was his main feature. He would beat everyone for no reason. He was killing people, and when people were climbing up that steep hill from the southern Boob River carrying water to the camp to cook something or to wash their faces, he could snatch those two buckets away from you almost on the top of the hill and throw them down the hill and also push you down the hill afterwards. Yes, he was very cruel. He initiated all those undertakings like evening checking, formations. When it was a rumor that somebody had brought some food, he made a search in the rooms and other places where people were staying. All of that was accompanied by hitting everybody, despite their age or state of health. He was throwing, pushing, and hitting when he was looking for food, for so-called kabak, when they were saying that somebody smuggled in a kabak. Because of only a single kabak, he could throw 50 people in all directions and beat them up. When they were taking men away to work at Werewolf, I was a boy, and I was not permitted to come up to that car. But my father was taken there for formation. He watched what Smetansky was up to there. When 30 selected people, who had been considered as capable workforce, were being placed into the body of the car, no one of them climbed into the body of the car without being hit by the stick of Smetansky. He had to hit everybody in the back. He was such a policeman. Policeman Takach was softer. He was mostly guarding a camp area, which was connected to the path down the hill towards the Boog River, where people were getting water. He knew of such cases, and we have people in our town who escaped. They were walking away and saw that he was sitting there watching them leave, but he pretended that he did not see anything. There were cases when Smetansky took a bribe and let people go, as they had agreed that they leave, say, at midnight, but beforehand he warned two policemen that he would let those people go so they would intercept them and bring them back to the camp. That was happening for sure. He would let people go and another policeman would catch them with the guide, beat them until they pass out, and some people died after that at the spot. They would pull them back to the camp. Especially women and children would die. Such mean deeds of Smetansky were notorious everywhere. The Jews from Mogilev and Bessarabia came up to me. Somebody told them that I knew the way. They told me, we will pay you something, a couple of marks, and you will just show us the way to the road. I said, how will I bring you there? When I am by myself or with the boys, we are able to climb over the fence. They, they said, we arrange this with the policeman who will be on duty. We agreed with his mistress about that and he will let us go. You only need to show us the way. There was a policeman, Semerenko, who had a Jewish mistress in the camp. Her name was Vasilyevskaya. He did everything for her. She was like a grand lady and lived very well there. I said, okay. They gave me two or three or five marks. I don't remember. Hardly had we walked down then we got into an entrapment. It was a notorious policeman there, Mishka Semolensky, and he was notorious for being worse than the beast, just could not be worse. There's no correct word to describe it. Dr. Bielski was notorious by administering shots to us and killing us by his experiments. So that policeman was notorious for hitting and shooting people. 
Everyone had a special feature. He started hitting people. He peep, beat everybody so badly that he made everybody handicapped. I was beaten by him badly too. He broke one of my arms, but I don't remember left or right. And you mentioned Mishka. Mishka in Kubanka. He always wore it. A Kazakh hat, Kubanka. He was always wearing it, had never taken it off. He was on the pipe. He was shot first by a Jewish officer of our army. We showed him to that officer, that captain, and he took him to the side and shot him. It was right before my eyes. I will show you that place. That was the best to do without the court trials, which they conducted later. They all came back. Some of them were sentenced for eight years, ten years, but they all came back and then stayed around. They said, what do you want from us? We have already served our sentences. We have already been punished. Now about one more episode. We had a policeman there. I don't remember his last name. So everybody called him Mishka or Kubanka. When people came up to the fence to exchange something for something, when he wanted, he let them do it. So a Jew from Mogliev climbed up the gate and wanted to exchange a bucket of cherries. He shot that Jew in his head and blew his brains out right away. I remember one time, one man, elderly man, because there was not young, young people until 14 years, 15 years. Uh, he exchanged a bucket of cherries for something, but he climbed on the fence probably too high, and a, pol a police guard shot him. They shot him so, and he was remaining on that fence for a couple of days. They should show everybody not to do this. The bucket of, the bucket with cherries fell down and the cherries spread all over around and none of us, we were hungry. None of us even touched one cherry. Yeah. I don't remember too much of the, of the brutality of the Romanians. There were no acts of shooting by them. I cannot say the same about the Ukrainian policemen. There were many cases with them. They were calm policemen. They just served their duty, just to some degree. But there were Samir Enko, Smetansky, a few more, who were very much rampant. They used to beat people with the sticks. Were you eyewitnessing how they were beating up people? Yes, I was. I saw how they were beating up my mother. Can you recollect how Smetansky was looking? Smetansky was very loud. Once I came to his house by mistake. To Smetansky? Yes, to Smetansky. He was home, and I sang under his window. I did not know where his house was in Pechora. He told his mother to bring out something to give me. I remember this. He was always drunk, under the influence, barely able to carry himself. Of course, after those policemen had been met by our partisans in 1944, and some of them were beaten by them very badly, they started behaving better. Some of them just quit. Uh, one time we were playing close to the gate, and the guards didn't like this. So one of the guards caught a little boy and started swinging him around and then kicked in a tree. So I killed him instantly. I remember this. And since that time, we didn't go to play by the gate. We were hiding. He, he, he swung the boy against the tree. Against the tree, yes. And killed him instantly. Camp was named the Dead Loop, not without a reason. The camp in Pachora, the Dead Loop. The Dead Loop. It was a name that existed at the time you were there or afterwards. At first, people from Tulchin came here. Its name was Pachora. It already existed before we were brought there. That's what people were calling this camp. The Dead Loop. That was Camp the Dead Loop.
It's just now I came to know that. At that time, nobody knew how this camp got this name. It's a loop, which is tightening gradually by hunger. By the way, Evgenia, do you know where this name, the dead loop, comes from? I will tell you now. Why wouldn't I know if I named it such way? You were the author of that name? Yes, yes. Please tell me about that. I will tell you now. We were walking to take water from the Bug River. One of us had a bottle, another had a jar. If we didn't have anything, we were taking on water with a shoe or put some clothes into the water and then carry it up the hill and squeeze it out to use that water to drink or to cook a meal or wash your face. At the riverside, we started talking about the camp, that it was really a dead loop. We meant that here there was no way out but the gate, and to walk through the gate, you had to deal with the police and dogs, so you wouldn't be able to come out. Why did they name it the dead loop? Who gave the name? I don't know. But all the people were calling it camp, the dead loop. Why? Because you can walk in, but in order to come out, you either will have a loop around your neck or your dead body will be brought out by the cart. I interrupted you at that episode when you wanted to tell about how you got out of that camp. Please proceed with that story. So our neighbor, Roisman's son helped our family. He already guided people twice, and he took all our family. Naturally, we promised to give him all we had. Yes, he was doing that, but he was risking his life. I'm very interested in this as well. I would like to clarify that. A man guided people from the death camp, the dead loop, and then came back? Yes, he came back to take other people out. Somebody came back, somebody was not able to come back. Those who came back were caught. What was his motive? Just to earn something for living. Sure, sure, some people had their motives. Some people took their relatives. He came back for his relatives. But they were shot. Dammer's family was shot. Their father was a political worker, and because of that, as soon as they came to the camp, all their family was shot. I helped him to escape. What happened to him later? Do you know? No, I don't. Where he was gone, I don't know. I did not see him either in Mogilev or anywhere else. There were other guides there, weren't they? I knew only him. Maybe there were some people who were keeping this secret. It had become known they would have been shot. This was passed from person to person secretly. Therefore, I would not know that. I am interested in the process of his work. Did he agree with somebody from the guards? How was it happening? No, probably he had some connection with the guards, but I am not aware of that. But I know that at night we went through the wicket door. It was in the fence on the right. It was a stone fence and there is a wicket door there. We went along the Pechora village towards Sherogrod. We reached, we reached Shpilkov, we went through Shpilkov, Rachni towards Sharogord. We walked about 25 kilometers overnight and reached Shpilkov. We were escaping from the camp with a baby. We were escaping and those Jews were standing behind and shouting to the policemen, look, they are escaping from the camp. The Jews were shouting, not Russians, no. <clears throat> yes, the Jews from the camp were shouting in Ukrainian, look, they are escaping from the camp. But he did not hear them. You know, we were destined to walk through. That woman guided us to the village of Krasnoye. The weather was snowy and freezing. We were cold. Hannah had gotten some kind of galoshes, and when we were gathered together to be taken away and shot, or to be taken to the Germans, 
and all the people's belongings were thrown into the fountain, when everything was over and we were running back to our rooms, I picked up a pair of galoshes and a pair of some very dry boots. I put on those boots, Hannah wore the galoshes, and Rosa just put some cloth around her feet. We were half naked. So we were walking and got frozen on our way. We came to the village of Krasnoye and told that woman that we wanted to come into a house to warm ourselves up and then would resume walking. When we walked outside, that woman disappeared and the street was empty. Thus, we stayed in Krasnoye overnight. For the first time, we were accepted. People dried our clothes and we left in the morning. It was not that scary for us to walk. It was not the road from Pechora to Krasnoye. It was the road from Krasnoye to Murafu. We came to Murafu and asked people to let us stay overnight. They situated us in their half basement. They were as poor as we were. They told us that we could spend a night there. We were accepted. Everything was all right. The baby was wrapped and had a flannelette kerchief around his head. My sister had a woolen kerchief, but she exchanged it for the flannelette kerchief only to wrap around her baby's head. We spent the night, got up in the morning, and that flannelette kerchief was gone from the baby. My sister was wearing a white calico kerchief, so she took that kerchief off and put it on her baby. So you imagine the road, winter time, we were walking with the baby, and the baby got frozen on the way, literally frozen. We arrived at some village with great difficulty. We walked into the last house on the edge. There were three boys there. I don't know whose boys, I don't know where those boys are now. May God bless them with good health. Their mother was away. They ran and called for their mother. The mother came, looked at all of us and said, I will feed you and you can leave the baby with me. I will bury him. Hannah started crying and screaming, saying, no, let's warm him up. The mother sent her boys to ask around the village for something, and they found some milk. We warmed up that milk and revived the baby with it. He came back to his senses. So we stayed there a little longer. She fed us, and we resumed walking again. We came to the village, no, the town of Shargorod. Wherever we asked people to let us stay overnight, nobody let us in. They told us to walk farther to a village where people would let us in. How to walk there in winter, in the evening? It was three or four kilometers away. We had to, so we walked to that village. We came up to a policeman's house. They just slaughtered a pig, and the wife accepted us and told us, you will spend a night here, but you can stay only till dawn. You have to leave early because if the neighbors see that you spent a night here, I will be in trouble and you will be in trouble. We spent the night in her house and resumed walking. We came to Popaigorod. We expected to be greeted there with open arms because we came back from hell. We came there and my sister asked why she hadn't smothered her baby. Like who deals with a baby in such times and why she needed that baby at all? People did not give us anything. We stayed there from Friday till Sunday and they did not even give us a breadcrumb. Nothing. We stepped outside. It was a thick layer of snow there. We picked up apple cores from apples which people had eaten. We ate those apple cores. But how could one feel satisfied with them only? Rosa ordered us, Fira, we are going back to Pechora to die. Let's go back to Pechora. Was it the winter of 1943 already? Yes, the winter of 1943, the beginning of 1943. So she says, let's walk to Pechora to die. And we headed back to Pechora. To die. Well, it was easy to say that we were going to walk there to die, but in real life it does not happen like that. 
when we were leaving Stupavino, it was not snowing. When we started walking out of it, it was snowing heavily. The road conditions were completely different and we did not know where to go. We got lost. We happened to come to some house. The woman there fed us very well, borscht, cereal, all kinds of food at a highest level. We left that house and resumed walking. We didn't know anymore which way to go. A policeman riding a horse caught us. He searched us. We had passports of the whole family, moms, dads, and mama sisters, which contained the photos. We were not able to exchange them for food. He said we were Stalin's spies and ordered us to walk in front of him. He was riding a horse behind us. He herded us to some village. My sister lost those photos on the way. We just threw those passports away. We came here and he told the local authorities that we were Stalin spies and had lots of passports. But did we not but we did not have anything anymore. Then we were driven to Luchinets. But our goal was to go back to Pechora and freeze there. Why would we stay in Luchinets? We were walking back after staying there for a few days. We were walking back to Pechora to die. Before we got back to Pechora, it's like a thousand and one nights. Again, we got lost. We were freezing. Rosa and I kissed each other, sat down together to freeze to death together. People say that it's very easy to get frozen. You start seeing beautiful dreams. You freeze and have nothing to think about anymore. We sat down. We were sitting and sitting, but we did not get frozen. The freezing weather did not get us. We were half dressed, barefoot, but we could not get ourselves frozen. I got up and saw the highway. In those times, they did not build highways through the fields. Only side roads were like that. We walked to that highway through the snow and walked farther and farther. We were wandering about for very long. I don't remember how much time it took, but finally we came back to Pechora. When we came to Pechora, everyone was astonished. They said, you had walked through so many places and people lived everywhere and you could stay there. Why did you come back to Pechora to die? We replied that our parents died here and we had to die there too. There was no other way. We didn't succeed in dying in Pechora either. Again, we had to make escapes to get food, experience the beating, ordeals and arrests. Again, we had to harness ourselves into sledges behind us and spend nights outside. There were so many tortures we went through, I can hardly tell about all of them. So we went through that fence door and we were walking for the whole night. It was me, my father, my mother, my sister Hannah, and a boy by the name uh, Leonchik. And Tietja was with us as well. Five people? Yes, it was me, my father, my mother, Auntie Etya, my father's sister, my sister Hannah, and her son by the name Leonchik. Yes, six people. We were walking for the whole night and we were able to reach Spilkov. We stopped there since it was not safe to walk in the daytime, so we could not do it. It was March. It was cold weather and we could not get anything to drink since the paddles were frozen. We would break them and lick the ice. That way we were moving forward. Again, it was night time and we were, were headed towards Rachni and Sherogrod. On the way, Leonch... Chika died. My sister put his body in the shelter belt area, covered it with some fallen tree leaves, tore off one of the sleeves from her bra blouse, and left it there in a hope that she would find him later. Thus we buried him and resumed walking and reached ghetto in Mogliev. We stayed with one family. They let us stay in the corridor. It was winter. Mama was sick. 
with tuberculosis. My sister was sick. My father was sick. He died almost at once. We buried him. Two weeks later, Auntie Etya died. Then my sister was not able to get up, and my mother was walking around and begging for something. Then my sister died, and after her, my mother died. All of that happened during eight days. All of them died. I remained alone. From your whole family who was in the camp, only you remained alive? Yes. Out of the whole Glinets family, of two parents, seven children, and two grandchildren, only I remained. In the camp, there were rumors. If you remember that, some of our military detachments broke through the Boog River. Then they were cut off and isolated. And some people told us about that. The year of 1944 came. We heard rumors and some information was available to us. My brother found a sheet of paper which we were reading secretly. It was handwritten saying that our troops were coming. It was not intended for the camp prisoners, but for the people living in open territories. In some places, the leaflets were distributed. They were not printed out, but handwritten. It was a people's resistance. It said that Red Army was coming and winning, and the enemy troops were defeated near Stalingrad and Moscow. That spirit meant a lot. Well, it was shooting. It was such a big shooting and nowhere to hide. People were running down from the third floor to the first one, but there were people downstairs as well. Around 200 or 300 people remained alive in the camp. They looked like walking corpses. It was January of 1944. In February, cannonade was heard. Again, suddenly, the Germans would surround and take away the men and young guys, and we remained there. Women, ch children, and the disabled. The Germans were standing on guard again, and we were waiting. However, we started having some food. The boys of my age, or a little older, and I, found several rooms of storages in the camp. In the camp territory? In the camp, in the same building. I will show where. They were in the basement. In 1944? It was in 1944, but they had been existing there since 1942. They were Red Cross supplies. Why did we break into them? Because the whole government was running away. They were not there. They were hiding somewhere in the villages. There was white flour, grain, cereals, even enameled pots. There were buckets. Everything was there. There were storages, and they contained cereals, flour, pots, and buckets. Our camp government was holding all of that. Before their eyes, during winter 1943 and 1944, from 300 to 350 people were dying daily. They were thrown on the sledges like firewood. If their relatives had something to pay for burying them properly, they were not taken to that cemetery up the hill. Here in front of me, in these barrack type ones, also many people were. But again, I repeat, it was in 1941, 1942, and then in 1943, and in March 1944. I remember them as kitchen and storages, where me and the other boys found all those treasures. So we started baking pie shells, just Lenten pie shells. It was hunger, freezing weather, and fear. The Germans were staying there. After the lunchtime, they said, the Germans shoot people only in the first part of the day. They don't shoot people in the afternoon. So we would eat those pie shells and bake the new ones. That's how it had been going on from the end of February till March 8th or 10th. The strongest cannonade was heard. I was standing nearby a German man, I will show near what door, and another German runs up to him and tells him something. 
Then he said, Hitler kaput, and ran away. He dropped his rifle down and ran away. Cannonade was getting stronger and stronger. Everybody was hiding in the cellars of Camp Potosky. In the morning or so, the cars stopped by the gate. It was shooting. It was such a thing. People were hiding in the Potoki sepulchre. He was buried there. There is his sepulchral vault there. Also, they were hiding in the cellars just everywhere they could. If they had been able to, they would have hidden themselves in the mice halls just to be sure that the ceiling would not fall on them. The cars drove in. There were soldiers wearing helmets and boots. It was spring and it was snow, ice crust, when there is water beneath and the top is frozen. It was mush in general. It was March of 1944. If nobody remembers, then it's for them to know that it was such spring there. It was sludge, the snow was deep. So the soldiers were walking in and one in their group went towards the sanitarium. Another group with the officer went to sepulchral vault. One more group went to another direction. I was walking downstairs from the third floor. Our soldiers, our soldiers, ours, ours, people were screaming. Our soldiers came, Russian soldiers. Whether the Russians want war? Ask my children, ask the mothers. Whether the Russians want war? Of course no. Of course they don't want it. They were in helmets, wearing hats and helmets on top of them, with red stars in front, old trench coats and boots, carrying rifles or automatic guns. I came up to one of them, and he looked at me and then hugged me. He was wearing moustaches. He held me close, then put his hand into his pocket, searched in there, and pulled out a piece of sugar. It was not pressed, refined sugar, but another type of refined sugar, which had a light bluish color. It was refined cube sugar. It was a small piece. He blew around it and gave it to me. He turned away and wiped his eyes with his sleeve. My mother was standing nearby, and other people were standing there as well. Later it became clear that he was crying. The other people came up to him, and he said that either in Smolensk, Oblast, or in Belarus, his family had been shot by the Germans, a daughter just like me, a small son, and his wife. It was around March 13th. I am walking. It is cold. I am coming out in the morning and seeing some people walking near the gates. I am running closer to them. I don't remember such shoulder straps or hats. I don't remember. The Ukrainians are greeting them with some milk already. I am running and asking, ours? They are saying, Gevek Stromp, come out, you sucker. It was such a case when our troops came into Tyvrov, and later the Germans forced them out, and afterwards they shot all the Jews and everybody who was greeting them. So what to do? How to make people come out? To my luck, there was a captain among them. Mikhail Bartik had a meeting with him in Moscow recently. He was Jewish. I tell him, I beg you, please go talk to them in Yiddish so they won't come out otherwise. And only after he came in and began talking in Yiddish, everybody started coming out. If the Soviet troops hadn't liberated us, I believe not a single human being would have remained alive in ghetto. They didn't allow you to live normal life. You were not permitted to work or to eat properly. How one could live so? It was a blessing that the Soviet troops liberated Mogilev. That's how the people remained alive and were able to tell us all about that. First of all, I would wish that such a thing would never happen again, that it was peace in the whole world and that people never ever knew what war is. I wish that people live peacefully, be friends with each other and value peace, which is life. Thank you. What would you like to tell those people who will be watching you and listening to you? 
First of all, preserve peace. Preserve peace and once again, preserve peace. And preserve those people who are fighting for peace, who want peace. And remember for the rest of your lives that war is horror. War is horror for all people, not only for the Jews. I wish that the future generations and everybody who is living now would know that we are happy to remain alive. We were rescued by the Russian people. Otherwise, nobody would have stayed alive. Also, that such a thing is never repeated again and nobody should ever know what fascism is. I was forced to kiss the German officer's boots just for him not to shoot me. It was right near the camp. I don't remember how exactly it was happening. I just remember how I was kissing his boots. Somehow I happened to step outside the camp and he wanted to kill me for that. So I kissed his boots. I wish that nobody ever sees such things, like the moments when we were being gathered to be shot. How many corpses were lying everywhere on the road around Pechora? One can hardly describe that. And how many corpses were in Pechora? I don't know. They show movies, we watch them, I understand. But even the actors are not capable of performing the way it actually was happening in real life. We just wish that such things are never repeated again. Now, I don't even believe that I was there. I don't believe it. I tell about it, but neither my son nor my grandchildren would understand me. God forbid that anybody goes through this. I, myself, cannot imagine that it really could happen. Dear listeners and dear watchers, I want to show you one thing. It is a Ukrainian sheepskin coat. It is our valuable family relic. It was in with us in the concentration camp Rogoznoye and concentration camp Pekora the Dead Loop and returned back here. So for 56 years, and it is even older than this, it is older since it was made before the war. It is maybe 60 years old, if not older, and it is still one piece and being used in our household. I cover stored potatoes with it. Here's an example. We have a deputy by the name of Smirnov. He is a Tulchina area rep native. He's not a worthy man. He just jumped up riding the wave. Is he a deputy of the Supreme Soviet? Yes, the deputy of the Supreme Soviet of Ukraine. Two weeks ago, at the Supreme Soviet, he said that people under six race stars are responsible for all problems in Ukraine. When did he say this? At the Supreme Soviet session, thus, neo-fascism is alive and neo-Nazism is there. And the worse is our life here in Ukraine. The faster it will outbreak. What to compare? This is the German ideology. This means that the fascists are coming to power while the Communist Party is so strong. They again are looking for somebody to blame. They cannot cope with it. They are robbing and stealing themselves and doing whatever they want, but at the same time they point at the Jews. For the sake of those who died, and for the sake of all their relatives who remained alive and who did not survive to nowadays, we should not allow this to repeat, not in a single spot on earth. They are armed well, they are getting ready, and getting ready well. And again, people will miss the point, just like they had missed it when the fascists came to power. Who is in this photo? This is me in this photo. I am seven years old going on eight. In the first row, the third from the left, this is me, that girl with dark hair. This is Captain Neiman, who liberated concentration camp.
It is my brother Mikhail Alexandrovich Krasner in the photo. He is a former concentration camp prisoner, now a doctor, a neurosurgeon of the highest category. Here I am with my Aunt Manya, who was in the concentration camp. This photo was taken in Spikov in 1946 or 1947. From left to right are my uncle Yasha, the youngest brother of my father, then my older brother Pete, then my second brother Yasha, and the youngest brother Boris. This photo of my mother was taken in 1914 when she was a girl. Her name was Riva Yosifovna. Yosifovna Sofro. This photo was taken in 1939. I was 10. It is me, Esther Yankelevna Gaba, in the photo. This is a monument which was put there in 1976. We get together here every year, recollect and share memories. My wife and I are among those prisoners. Mogilov Podolsk, yes. Ukraine. What kind of work was your father doing at the time? He was a, a tailor. And your mother? My mother, before World War II, she used to work in a barber shop. Yeah. Actually, after World War II, he was a tailor. Before World War uh, II, he was a shoemaker. Shoemaker, yes. This is, this is myself in 1940. Before World War II, in Mogilo Podolsk. This is the most tragic page in the history of this country, in the history of our village in particular. And despite those events happened more than 70 years ago, nobody has a right to forget about them. Our school kids undertook responsibility to clean up the territory where the victims of the concentration camp, the dead loop, were buried. They never forget about that. When we have general school holidays or gatherings, we always bring flowers to the memorial board, which is in the camp territory. When the Memorial Day of Holocaust comes, we arrange meetings with the former camp prisoners and conduct lessons of memories. Also, we take part in school-based seminars and tell our guests about the events which happened here. Generally, we are learning to be humane and tolerant to everything that happened here and to all people who stayed there. What is the children's attitude to this? What is your attitude? In the majority, they take it with understanding. They always listen attentively when somebody talks about this. Thank you. Kinor ha etzev bimit yapeach nuge halachan kofe yareach tamshir hakleizmer ba ayara shenim chataim hatavera beta hamave. Nadam halachan, meitar karua, mulkor hapachad, vegam hakleizmer, nerokava, sear hayeled, afach seiva. Hasbo nagelim mechadash, kinor. 
דור השכחה, עתי צרב בנשמתי, הסכר שנמחה. אז בואו תפולים מחדש, שיריך טלאי על טלאי, והלבישני בגד חג, אתה תקוות חיי. מיליון עיניים נושאות שלוות, נושאות אלינו, אשמה נוקבת, הם לא הספיקו להזדקן. על כל אחינו נגן נגן. כינור העצב מיתר הרועד, אתה הנצר, אתה העד. לך נשבענו, כי לא נשכח, ומן האופל תקווה תצמח. אז בוא נגן לי מחדש. כינור השכחה, עד יצרב בנשמתי הסכר שנמחה. אז בואו תפונים מחדש, שיריך טלאי על טלאי, ואל בישני בגד חג, אתה תקוות חייך.